And then I saw what had happened. A deadly train disaster near DuPont. An Amtrak passenger train derails, smashing onto I-5. And you start to see the, the roof kind of you know, peel. You're just like, is this ever going to stop? And it stopped. And when it stopped, it was completely black. Now at 5, survivors describe the horror when the train cars plummeted. What went wrong? The federal investigation just getting underway. And the major impact to the transportation grid as southbound Interstate 5 remains closed. This afternoon, and it basically shows the crash scene. This is nearly 10 hours after this tragic situation happened. As you can see here, passenger cars still dangling from this overpass, this debris field on both sides of that rail bridge, and also an investigation that is just getting started at this time. Now, the derailment has killed at least three people. Dozens more are injured, many of them critically, and are receiving treatment at hospitals all around the South Sound. The crash happened at 7.33 this morning. The train was heading southbound when it hit a curve near I-5. Something went wrong. 12 cars and one locomotive plummeted off the tracks. Now this derailment happened near DuPont where the tracks cross above the interstate. All southbound lanes of I-5 at this point are still closed. And after all of this, it could be a very long time before they are reopened. Our Mark Wright and Amanda Grace are live near that crash scene with the very latest guys. David Laurie, the crash of that train is right behind us here. We're on an overpass just north of the crash scene. The Eagles Pride Golf Course is right here where a massive command center has been set up. I just saw a Port of Seattle police car drive through here, and there are law enforcement and first responders from all over the region. And federal investigators are arriving on the scene tonight to try to figure out exactly what went wrong here. Over the next hour, we're going to tell you a lot more about this deadly derailment. We're going to also be hearing from people who survived this crash and we're going to take an in-depth look at what the National Transportation Safety Board is going to be examining as they take a closer look at this crash. Uh, we can tell you that 13 cars jumped the tracks this morning, some of them still hanging off that overpass at this hour. The, trans the passenger cars collided with a semi and several other vehicles on I-5. The crash injured more than 70 people. Area hospitals launched their mass casualty emergency plan to handle the wounded. And King Five's Chris Daniels just went to a press conference, attended that just behind us here and joins us live now. Chris, what did you learn? What's the newest information? Well, I think what we've heard from the Washington State Patrol is to expect that this potentially will have impacts in the morning commute. That has been an issue throughout the day. People being rerouted through JBLM, being rerouted to the west on Highway 16 and down Highway 3 to get to Olympia after what you see here behind us. This is the area that a lot of people know on Interstate 5 as the Mounts Road exit right as you go into the Nisqually Delta. This was supposed to be a momentous day for Amtrak, but it's turned out to be a dark day. The pictures tell a story this afternoon that still has plenty of unknowns. Amtrak 501 was on its inaugural run from Seattle to Portland when it's 733 it abruptly stopped. I need EMS ASAP. It looks like they're already starting to show up. Hey guys, what happened? Ha, uh, we were coming around the corner to take the bridge over I-5 there, uh, right north into Squally, and we went on the ground. Um, is everybody okay? I'm still figuring that out. We got cars everywhere and down onto the highway. That the emergency called the dispatchers. 12 cars derailed, one hanging over I-5, yet another on the freeway itself, all during the morning commute. Rescue crews pulled survivors, and bodies from the wreckage. There are some casualties. The train was on a brand new stretch of track in a slight turn over I-5. An online record show was traveling near 80 miles an hour prior to the derailment. Can you say whether this train was going too fast for this turn? I can tell you that it's being investigated by NTSB and anything beyond that right now until their findings are out is pure speculation. Late this afternoon, Amtrak tried to quell reports of what went wrong. Any Has Amtrak been told anything about an obstruction on the tracks? It is under investigation by the NTSB. But they are now the lingering questions about a route which never officially completed its first run. So yeah, a lot of questions right now, more than answers. And you can see the, the crews, the heavy machinery now here on site, waiting to go in as soon as they get the all clear from NTSB. So Chris, we're hearing the train was going about 80 miles an hour. Do we know what the speed limit was 
in that stretch of the track. Yeah, I think a lot of people are going to focus on this in the coming days because there is a website that tracks the active speed of the trains. And according to that website, it showed this train going about 79, 80 miles an hour before this derailment occurred. Now, whether it was actually going that speed, we cannot say. We, we know there are signs down here that say there's a speed limit of 30 miles an hour. We also can say from being here on the scene throughout the day, we have seen the inspectors, the investigators looking at that turn. You can see it in the aerials where it almost looks like the train continued to go straight as opposed to making the turn, and that's where speed would perhaps come into play. And that front locomotive went well beyond the overpass there. Yeah, way down the hill onto Interstate 5 as traffic was going southbound on Interstate 5. Chris, I was going to ask you, one of the scariest sort of heartbreaking things about this scene were those cars dangling. Mm -hmm. um, they couldn't go into those cars for a while because it was too dangerous, right? Yes. yes, and we've been told by the Washington State Patrol here in the last hour that they believe that they have gone now through every car, even those ones that are dangling. They believe they have now done a head count, but they are being very cautious at this point as far as the numbers of deceased and the numbers of injured. Chris. Thank you so much. All right, Chris Daniels, thank it. you. So as we mentioned, that crash injured more than 70 people today. Pretty much everybody, everybody on that train had to go to the hospital because of something. First responders rushed to get the wounded to several trauma centers and ERs in the South Sound. King 5's Amy Moreno uh, joins us live now from Tacoma General. They took some of the more seriously injured uh, of the victims here. Amy. Yeah, this morning it was a scramble for those emergency responders to get everyone on ambulances and send them out to hospitals around the region. Just to give you an idea of some of those numbers, Madigan, which is at Joint Base Lewis McGord, they got 19 people. Harborview in Seattle ended up with three patients. Providence St. Peter had people. Three multi care hospitals in the region that includes Allen Moore and Good Sam and here Tacoma General. They got more than 20 patients. Three people here at Tacoma General are still in serious condition tonight. This morning when the news broke, all of the hospitals in the region got ready to help out. Before ambulances were even en route, Tacoma General and other multi care hospitals activated their mass casualty protocol. Extra employees were called in to help, and they asked the blood bank for more supply. They were ready and able. I was uh, in the uh, Tacoma General Emergency Department before we started getting casualties, and, uh, and there was uh, significant teams of nurses, physicians, anesthesiologists, uh, the uh, surgeons, the group ready to take care of patients. That care included a team that waited in the lobby of the hospital trying to wave down family members. Their goal was to connect the injured with their loved ones. It's a key part of the care because we're not just bodies. We're human beings with emotions and uh, mental health and, uh, and physical issues, and we take care of the whole person here. Now, in terms of the injuries they saw, we're told there was a very broad range. They had some people who were treated and released to the hospitals. Some people needed surgery. Some people have been admitted, and they will be staying overnight at hospitals throughout the area. For now, we're live in Tacoma. Amy Marino, King 5 News. We're following the closure of southbound I-5 is having a ripple effect on traffic all over the region. Let's bring in King 5 Stephen Kilbreth for a look at what's happening traffic-wise, and especially tomorrow morning, Stephen. This area normally is a mess. Tomorrow I can't imagine what it's going to be like. Oh, for sure, Mark. You have no, uh, no question about that. It's going to be a mess. We, this is like one of those areas where it's always bad traffic because on one side you have Joint Base lewis McCord, On the other side you have uh, essentially parts of the water, So, and there's not a lot of alternate routes. You know, this is uh, between Olympia and Tacoma. One of the worst spots in the entire state for traffic. This is where Mark and Amanda are standing. Same overpass, and you can see uh, the scene there. Just a reminder, northbound remains open, so no delays or closures northbound. But let's take a look at the headlines now. Southbound I-5 remains closed. There are local detours available, although I've heard some rumors of people getting turned away at Perimeter Road and other places at Joint Base lewis McCord. so it may not be the best way to go, especially if you don't know your way around that area. People also thinking of using the passes, but don't forget tonight there'll be lots of snow on the passes. The ferries, some major delays on some of our ferries this afternoon. Some of the other de detours are actually really the only other ones. Highway 7 to 507 to 510 and Highway 16 to Highway 3. Let's talk about the Highway 16 to Highway 3 one. Uh, Lori just uh, found out from a friend it took him three hours and 10 minutes to get from Seattle to Olympia, but right now two hours and 35 minutes from Tacoma going around this way to Olympia. And we take a look at the map and show you that most of that traffic here out of Tacoma 
through Gig Harbor up to Purdy. This is Highway uh, 302 there for those folks going across the Purdy Spit. Remember, these are all two-lane roads that people are going to be on. For those folks trying to get out of Gorst, down through Bell Fair, you can see pretty tough traffic there, even leaving Bremerton as people use the ferries, and that adds to the commute for those folks trying to get down to Olympia. And the other route that we were talking about is Highway 7, 507, and 510. That takes you about two hours and 36 minutes right now, and I can show you that leaving Parkland through Spanaway. Here's the Roy Y. Some people are trying to get uh, out of this traffic and head this way, but if you do that, you're going to be backed up all the way on Highway 702, so it's a good idea until you get here. But uh, certainly lots of trouble for some folks as we send it back over to Amanda and Mark. All right, Stephen, thank you. So as you're heading southbound on Interstate 5, right when you get into the Joint Base lewis mccord area, things get funneled off to the right, and you really do come to a standstill. And King 5's Alyssa Hahn joins us live from there with what it looks like and the unusual measures they're taking to try to ease some of the congestion. Alyssa. Mark and Amanda, we're on one of the southbound exits to DuPont. It's also known as the Center Drive exit or exit number 118. I'm going to have photographer Tate Miller push in on the scene behind me. That's southbound I-5. You can see those white headlights and those blinking yellow lights. You can see how all the southbound cars behind me are forced to take this exit, and that is what is causing all the slowdown. Now, when we drove this way around 3 p.m. today, the backup on I-5 really wasn't too bad because most of the drivers heeded the warning from Washtot and found another route. But it was just about a mile long at that point, but it took us 45 minutes to drive that mile to exit 118. Once you get in that stretch of traffic, there is no way to make a U-turn until the exit. When drivers take off the off-ramp at Center Drive, they actually have a few choices, so listen carefully. You can actually exit and stop in DuPont. You can cross the overpass to turn around to northbound I-5. The third choice is to take the detour through the JBLM gate to continue southbound down Perimeter Road to State Route 510. But WashDOT is reminding everyone here, hey, this isn't for all southbound traffic, all the typical traffic that comes down southbound I-5. It's really just for the locals. And you can see behind me, that's the backup right there. That is the traffic that is going into JBLM. They took the unusual measure of opening the gates to the public. I am told by the PAO, the public affairs officer, you do not need base credentials to get just at this gate. The other gates you still do, but this gate, the public can enter, but it's a very long detour, so be warned. Reporting live in DuPont, Alyssa Hahn, King 5 News. Alyssa, thank you. And we're looking live at the scene, and I have to tell you, just standing here on this overpass, just north of this derailment site, there is a soft glow of these uh, searchlights that are trained on that mangled train as it's dangling from the overpass. A huge crane has been brought in, and the meticulous process will begin of measuring where everything is, and then they're going to start taking this train apart piece by piece. That's why investigators here are not giving us a time estimate. Southbound Interstate 5 is shut down, and they don't know if it's going to be for a day or two or three or more. But at this point, we do know it is it is shut down and a massive um, recovery and investigation scene. The response has been pretty incredible and incredibly coordinated. Uh, Eagles Pride Golf Course is just over here next to us right now. Uh, that's where the command center has been established. Yeah. And we have seen crews from everywhere, from the entire surrounding area. Uh, they're coming there to refuel. Uh, they're coming there to, to get instructions, to be told what to do next. Uh, at any given moment, there are hundreds of people uh, who are here, who are ready, who want to help. Uh, right now, we're live in Deep Point. We're going to continue our coverage coming up uh, derailment explained the possible problems that investigators will focus on and the safety system that may have helped prevent the crash Investigators are on the scene of a deadly train derailment in DuPont this morning. The State Patrol confirms at least three people have died in the derailment. The Amtrak train, which is en route from Seattle to Portland, about 100 people have been transported to hospitals. Train cars tumbled onto the southbound lanes of I-5. Those southbound lanes remain closed tonight, and they could stay that way until the morning commute. Uh, the National Transportation Safety Board dispatched investigators to the scene of this derailment here in DuPont. So whenever there's a natural uh, disaster like this, a, a 
crash like this, they assemble what's called a go team. Yeah. Um, we've heard that there are at least two members from the West Coast here, the rest of the team being assembled from Washington, D.C., experts in a variety of different aspects of this crash. They are on scene tonight, part of them. We're expecting the rest of them later today later this evening. Earlier today, a member of that National Transportation Safety Board team was asked if there was any new technology on board that train. And, um, that's why we've launched a full GO team with all the different types of experts. Uh, we're gathering information and we will do our best to pass it on to you as soon as we find out exactly what type of technology and what, um, you know, what that type of technology that you're speaking about, if it actually is on that, that route. So let's bring in our transportation expert, Glenn Farley. He's in studio. Uh, Glenn, let's talk a little bit about what the NTSB was saying about technology on these trains. Well, the technology they're talking about, which we're going to get into a little bit on King 5 News at 630, is going to be probably what they're talking about as positive train control. But there's also technology that will help answer as to why this happened. So let me set you up here with the scene over I-5 right here. This, that is the lead locomotive. It is a Siemens Charger. It is brand new. And that's how it ended up here. It is literally been shredded as it came down here off this curve. You can just see the trajectory that it hit on the way down. It pulled these cars down along with it. And then obviously things even got worse because you have another locomotive here General Electric P42. Although Amtrak says that that locomotive was not pushing, it was basically idling, that is still a lot of weight against all of these lighter weight cars. So there you have a car down on I-5. You have the accordion effect here with these cars there and there. And this is the curve in the track. Sound Transit owns this track now. The speed on that curve, they confirm, 30 miles per hour. So some people say, well, this was old crummy track. Not the case. Let me show you some video here. This is of testing, uh, which they did for months down there. This is a little bit further north, but this is the same line. One of the, the biggest concern here so far was about all these crossing accidents. This entire line was upgraded for $181 million, new signals, everything else. But the safety concern had really focused on these crossings because you have a lot of congestion going in and out of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the Army and Navy and Air Force Base at JBLM also the National Guard at Camp Murray. So that was a big concern. There's one of the crosses uh, right there, one of the crossings right there. So that's kind of where it is. This is in a different section. We also back here went from concrete ties back to wood ties, but Sound Transit says this entire line has been upgraded. So Glenn, coming up at 6.30, you're going to be talking about that positive train control. That essentially would be automation that could take over trains in the cases where there is human error. But that has been delayed, right? It has been delayed. It has been put on hold. It has been implemented in some places. It has not been implemented in others. Amtrak says their train here was not under control of positive train control. So had it been, that would have slowed this train down, but it was not. Glenn, how close will this investigation be to the investigation of, say, a plane crash? It's basically a similar type of situation, a process of deduction. So you have experts in this case, experts in track, experts in the mechanics, experts in things like signaling, experts in human factors, basically the engineer, the rest of the crew, what was their performance like here. But you can tell a lot because in a plane crash, I mean, cover them, you know, you can end up with very little pieces uh, that have to tell a very big story. Here you have more to work with. So you can look at how things bent. Uh, you can look at breakage rates. You can see all of these things here in fairly quickly be able to assemble the scenario as to how everything here happened. All right, King 5's Glenn Farley, our transportation expert. Glenn, thank you for your expertise tonight. And Amanda and I will be back in a few minutes with additional information about the investigation into today's deadly train crash. Right. And for now, let's send it back to the studio to David and Lori. Okay, Amanda, thank you, and thank you, Mark.
Yeah, yes, indeed. Now it's time to talk weather with meteorologist Rhonda Lee. Outside from our vantage point, we can see rain outside. Well, that's just the beginning of it. We have a lot to talk about. I hate to pile it on, folks, but we do have some pretty interesting weather headed our way. Let's head out right now. Temperature wise, we are doing okay. We're at 45 degrees and uh, raining for most of us, and you'll see that on our radar. Just how much rain have we had so far? In fact, since the last hour, this 0.28 has gone up in Seattle, 0.32 in Arlington. Um, looking at Oak Harbor, Oak Harbor at 0.15 and then 0.41 in Olympia with more to come. Here is our big map and you can see all of the moisture associated with this low pressure system. That is bringing a, a pretty good dollop, if you will, of moisture and wind later on. So let's dissect all of our colors here. What do you see here in the pink? Those are your winter weather uh, warnings. Meanwhile, let's start with our wind advisory from 6 o'clock in the morning tomorrow to about 4 a.m. Uh, so just keep in mind, folks, I should say this is actually say 4 p.m. Uh, winds basically 15 to 30 miles per hour and some gusts up to about 45 along the entire I-5 corridor. But then on top of that, as you go along the passes, we are looking at locally three feet of snow in the areas that you see draped in the pink, mainly along the Cascades as well as the Olympic Mountains as well and anything above 3500. But having said that, some of that snow level is going to come dropping down between about now and into tomorrow as well. So I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. Meanwhile, our mountain forecast about 30 degrees heavy snow. Like I said, anywhere between one to maybe three, maybe even four feet. The higher up you go, about 3000 feet is where we actually start. So let's get to this. This is our big, huge wall of water. There is the front itself as it comes through. You can see that line right about there, but wrapping around that are some pretty gusty winds. That deepening low is going to bring those wind totals totals up and our rain totals as well. Easily up to two inches the further south you go from Olympia into Tacoma as well. Right as we get into Seattle, over about an inch and a half of rain. But as I said, lest we forget about the snow, we could easily, easily get two feet and maybe even three feet from about Crystal Mountain, even up through Snoqualmie Pass, uh, getting more than a foot of snow into Mount Baker as well. But I also, I know your eye went right to 405. I'm going to zoom in for you to see that right about here here, mainly our higher elevations, about a thousand feet and higher could easily see a dusting of snow. Nothing that's going to be major accumulation effort, but nevertheless, snow. And of course, we know what that means around here. Slick roads across the area. So tomorrow, a high of 46 degrees by Wednesday, that AM mix and then some sunshine at about 39 by Thursday, 40 degrees and mostly sunny sky with just a few peaks of sun coming through. But don't forget that is also the first day of winter. So our solstice begins there. Then as we get into Friday, 40 degrees, Saturday, 42, Christmas Eve, 43 degrees and mostly sunny. That's something you don't get to say all that often around here here either is a nice sunny Christmas Eve and 39 degrees at that point. And then as we get into Christmas Day, 39 and again, not bad, but a little bit on the chilly side. OK, thank you, Rhonda. You're thank you, Rhonda. Coming up, we're going to talk to a train expert who weighs in on what possibly went wrong. That's next. Thanks for staying with us as we cover this deadly train derailment south of Tacoma tonight. We actually got some positive news tonight from hospitals in this area about the numbers of patients that have been discharged from the hospital. MultiCare Health says that from Good Samaritan, 12 people have been discharged now. Alan Moore, also in that system, two people have been discharged. Seven from Madigan Army Medical Hospital here at JBLM. Seven have been released. So 21 people have gotten out of the hospital tonight who were injured today. Four people are still at Tacoma General. And earlier today, we had a chance to speak with a train expert about what could have gone wrong here. And what, what jumps out to me, again, I want to be preliminary here because we've got experts that are going to be on scene to determine the ultimate cause. but. You're, you're, you're going into a curve, and so uh, speed is a major factor. Uh, and uh, you know, locomotives like this are equipped with data recorders that will it t say exactly what, how that train is operating. Black boxes, basically. It's, it's a black box, correct. Um, it will indicate speed. It will indicate how the train was braked. Um, and there are two braking systems on trains like these. One is from the head end itself. That's called an independent brake. And then the air system, which I think one of your reporters talked about, that goes throughout the rest of the train. But the brakes in this situation, once it leaves the track, cannot set up effectively or fast enough in order to slow its momentum. 
The NTSB is here to investigate. They're going to have an update tonight at 1115. So directly behind us, southbound lanes of Interstate 5 are completely shut down. We don't know when they will reopen. Let's go to Stephen Kilbreth now for a look at some alternate routes. Stephen, what can you tell us? I had north before the commute, uh, be, before the train derailment happened, so now they all have to get home. And this is where Mark and Amanda are standing. Same spot. You can see there the scene in the background. Northbound, just wanted to remind you that the northbound lanes are still open. All the lanes are open there northbound. So let's take a look at it. Southbound I-5 is closed. Local detours are available. Don't forget uh, Highway 7 to 507 to 510, about 2 hours and 40 minutes. 16 to Highway 3 is about 2 hours and 43 minutes right now. Those are the two main alternates. If you live in that area, Area, you can take some of those local detours, but they'd like you to go around if at all possible. We also have a jackknife semi that has Highway 18 closed eastbound getting to 167 and also an accident southbound 167 in Ellington that could cause some folks some traffic problems as well. Lots of problems this afternoon. In fact, take a look at this. The entire commute is really bad for your afternoon drive wherever you may going, be going, so just be aware of that and take a look at the alternate routes around the train derailment where it's really tough for those folks too. heading in the west direction over towards Belfair and Gorst and places like that. So so don't forget the morning commute is going to be impacted as well, but hopefully people will be able to telecommute once they do finally get home today as we send it back over to you guys. All right, Stephen, thank you. So officials from across the state of Washington have been reacting to today's deadly train tragedy. Senator Patty Murray tweeting, it's been a tough day in Washington. My heart goes out to the families who've lost a loved one today. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal also weighed in sharing her condolences. And Seattle's Mayor Jenny Durkin says the derailment is horrific. She says her thoughts are with those hurt and the first responders who rushed to the scene. Many are still left looking for answers in the wake of the train derailment today. We continue our team coverage after this break. Like right now. Tonight, a community is reeling as the investigation continues for a cause of an Amtrak train derailment that killed three people and injured dozens more near DuPont. A locomotive and 12 cars left the track. Some crashed onto the southbound I-5 lanes below. It was the first regular run on a newly opened route from Seattle to Portland. Some avid train fans purposely bought tickets for the trip that ended so tragically. And you know what, Laura, a couple of them actually spoke to King Vibes, Drew Mickelson, from their hospital bed. So, Drew, how are they tonight? Well, David, 79-year-old uh, Charlie Hebner said it best when he said, we're alive. He and his wife walked away from this train wreck. Charlie is a retired state employee who lives in Olympia, and he is a big fan of trains. He roll, rode on the old Amtrak route just last week and was eager to be on the first trip of the new route this morning. His wife, Beverly. A lot of tossing and squealing and rattling of the train. It kind of got dark, and uh, I found myself on the floor. Try your blessings. Yep. Try to live day to day. Keep out of trouble. And yeah. it sounds like some people. Maybe that... I should stay off trains. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should think about it or be a little more astounded. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Right now you're just grateful. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. We're both I... alive. Charlie says he heard something weird coming from beneath the train for about the last minute before he says everything uh, went dark and he heard the screaming. And you heard him describe there some of the, the chaos that they that they went through. They were pretty surprised that they were able to walk out of there, especially when they looked around and they saw some of the other people who were not in as good shape. We have good news to report. The Hebners were released from the hospital late this afternoon. Live along I-5, I'm Drew Mickelson. Back to you. Drew, thank you. Passengers who didn't need medical help were taken to DuPont City Hall. And that's exactly where Allison Morrow has been all day. So, Allison, how are they doing at this time? Yeah, well, this is the place where complete strangers gave each other support, even became friends after having gone through this extremely traumatic situation. Many of them told us uh, that they were numb, that they really felt like the reality of the situation had not fully sunk in yet. They were very excited to be on this first inaugural run and could not believe how terribly it all went wrong. 
This is Anthony Raimondi. Notice his Amtrak jacket. He says he worked as a ticket agent for the company over 17 years and rode the train's inaugural run for fun today, hoping to be part of history, but not like this. One guy pushed out the window and I helped him get down and he helped me get down and we crawled underneath the train and I could hear people screaming and stuff in the other parts so and then by that time ambulances and stuff were coming. Strangers became fast friends like Patricia Freeman helped out of the train by Scott Claggett. I heard the sound first and then felt instability 